All right, now in Acts chapter 2 here, we see in verse number 1, it says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. So this is, this is taking place at the day of Pentecost. Now I'm going to start off, because it, because it has to do with this chapter mainly, there's, you know, there's, a, there's a movement out there that takes a gross misinterpretation of these events that happen here that are called Pentecostals. It's a Pentecostal movement, and they get their name from, from Acts 2 here, where it says, you know, it's the day of Pentecost. And all these events happened that we saw where men were speaking with other tongues, and there was, you know, all this, um, you know, souls ran into the church, and there was all these things going on, and they take this, and they just, they just have this, it's because they're lost, but they have this, this warped, demented doctrine that they follow on, on what's known as speaking in tongues. Now, the King James Bible never uses the phrase speaking in tongues. It's not found. That's found in the newer versions. But they're referring to the events that happen here. And we're going to start off just, I just want to show you because they'll, um, we're going to jump down to verse 37. Because this is the first proof that, that they preach a false gospel. Every Pentecost I've ever talked to, they, they believe in work salvation. They believe you could lose your salvation. It's the same thing. They believe in works. They believe you have to have works in order to be saved. It's a false gospel. And there's churches, I, I, I was told that there's a church that's called Acts 2.38, you know, Pentecostal church or whatever. Because, I mean, nine times out of ten when you talk to them, they're going to they're gonna try to bring you Acts 2.38, Acts 2.38. You know, when you ask them, what do you have to do to be saved? They're going to say, Acts 2.38. They won't even quote the verse. They say, they just say, give the reference. It's kind of funny, but look at what it says in Acts 2.37. We're going to start reading verse 37. The Bible says, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So if you're not familiar with the movement, I'll, I'll briefly summarize it. They say you have to repent, and their definition of repent is you have to turn from your sins. You have to give up a sinful life. You have to be baptized. They believe that baptism is what saves. And what they, what they do is they take this verse, they say, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And, they, and what they're doing is they're understanding the word for. They're saying that, you know, in, in order to be saved, in order to have remission of sins, in order for your sins to be cleansed, they're saying you have to be baptized. That's not what that word for means. The word for Oftentimes, not, I mean, in some cases it can be meant that way, but it's not in this case. The word for oftentimes means, you know, because of. And in this sense, it's exactly what it means. You're baptized, everyone in the name of Jesus Christ, for, because of, the remission of sins. So that is why we get baptized, and that's why baptism takes place after a person gets saved. Acts chapter 8, you know, explains that very clearly with the Ethiopian eunuch and Philip, where he asks to be baptized, says, you know, uh, what doth hinder me baptized? And, and, he said, and Philip said unto him, you know, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he stopped and he baptized him right there. The belief was necessary because the belief is where the salvation comes from. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And see, this is, this is funny because they'll take you here. Look at verse 37. It says, they ask the question, men and brethren, what shall we do? Okay. And then he answers, repent and be baptized. Now, what do you think is a better? Keep your finger there. Look at Acts chapter 16. If you're going to base your doctrine on salvation, if you're going to base it on a verse, what do you think makes more sense? Okay, because they're both, there's two questions. There's this, this question in Acts 2.37, then there's a question in Acts 16, verse 30. Which one do you think is a little bit more clear in regards that it's talking about salvation. Acts 2.37 said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Nothing ever mentioned about salvation, about being saved, about everlasting life, eternal life, anything like that. Acts uh, 16.30 says, and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? I don't know, that sounds like a, a more clear question to me. And their answer, it says in verse 31, they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. That's where we get our doctrine from. It's very clear. It's very explicit. What must, what are the requirements? What do I have to do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. The Bible says it very clearly there. 
They're taking this verse in Acts 2.37 when he just says, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And saying, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for remission of sins, and you shall receive the, the gift of the Holy Ghost. They're, say, they're taking that verse, and that's like they, they've twisted and taken it to be their entire gospel. And say, no, 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 you have to do these works, you have to be baptized, and then they'll, they'll also use it as a, their proof. Because it says, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And when they say that, the gift of the Holy Ghost, they, they basically equate that to, well, since they received the Holy Ghost, and they started speaking with other tongues, then it says here, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So, the only way basically that you can prove that you're really saved is if you start speaking with other tongues. And that's kind of the logic that they use in this doctrine. And it's a twisted logic. It doesn't make any sense. And it's a completely bizarre doctrine. But, um, the, I mean, for one, we see it that they're, they, they grossly misinterpret. They, they misinterpret the word repent by just automatically assuming it even has to do with sins. Now, the, what, who, uh, who Peter's talking to here, you know, in the verses prior to verse 37, he's talking to people that were the ones essentially responsible for killing the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at, um, go up a few verses from in Acts 2. Go back to Acts 2 if you're there. It says in verse 36, it says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. So he goes on this whole, you know, we're going to get into that a little bit later on this whole stuff about Jesus Christ. But he's saying, look, you're the ones that have crucified him. You're the ones that, you know, you crucified him. God made him Lord and Christ. And they heard all of this stuff because... He brings up Old Testament prophecy, and he equates it to, to, to what was happening at that time, and he's explaining to him, look, this is Jesus Christ. He goes to the book of Psalms, and he says, look, this is what was written about Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus Christ fulfilled this. He was the Christ. He is the Messiah. You crucified him. Your wicked hands are the ones that, that made him put, be put to death. And that's when they say, you know, they were pricked in their heart, the Bible says, um, in verse 37. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. Yeah, I would say if they had any conscience whatsoever, when you shed, when when you when you're the ones responsible for shedding innocent blood, when you're the ones responsible for putting the, the Son of God to, to death on the cross, it pierced them. And, Je and and Peter here is preaching God's word. God's word is powerful, and God's word is is um, sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing even you know dividing asunder even to the or to the dividing of the. Uh, Joints, marrow, it pierces the heart. Their heart was pierced here. They were pricked in their heart. And that's when they said, you know, well, what should we do? You know, what do we do about this? We killed him. And that's why he tells them, look, repent. They all had a false gospel. They were false teachers. They believed in a false religion. They had to stop believing in their false religion and their wicked ways. They had to believe on Jesus Christ. And then he tells them, you know, what should you do? Of course, you should repent and be baptized. Every, every, everybody should repent and be baptized. That's a true statement. Of course we should. We should, we should get saved. We should believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins or because of the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, as I mentioned in Acts chapter 1, there's a difference between the indwelling of the Holy Ghost and the power of the Holy Ghost upon you, basically. The baptism. This is what we see here. The baptism of the Holy Ghost is what happens here in chapter number 2 that was spoken of in chapter 1. Because we know from, the, from last week that they're already indwelled with the Holy Spirit. They're already indwelled with the Holy Ghost. And when someone gets saved, you are indwelled with, this, with the Holy Ghost as well. Anyone who puts their faith on Jesus Christ and gets saved, that person has a new spirit inside of them. The Holy Ghost comes and, and will live within their heart. And, and that is something that happens to every believer in the New Testament. Every believer gets that. But not every believer gets this, this extra gift of this, like this baptism of the Holy Ghost. It doesn't happen all the time. But it happens here. And this is where we see, and we're going to go through this a little bit, in um, 
In verse number 2, it says, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they're sitting. So they're sitting in the house. You know, they're in one accord. They're in one place. They're praying. They're preaching. You know, they're, they're together. And there's a sound of a, of, a, of a rushing wind, and it fills the whole house where they're sitting. And then it says in verse 3, And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. So there's these tongues that just like, that sits on them. I don't know exactly how it was. I kind of picture it like above their heads or something that's kind of like sitting on them. And there are these tongues, and cloven means like split. So I mean, you kind of think of like, like a serpent's tongue is a little bit split. They're cloven tongues, and it was like as a fire. So there's these flaming tongues that are kind of resting above all these people um, that were in this place. It's, I mean, it's, it's obviously a miracle. It's, it's an incredible miracle. And they're baptized because the whole house was filled. The Holy Ghost comes in, and he, and he gives them these tongues. He gives them a special ability, and they're able to see this. And they have these special tongues upon them. And it says in verse 4, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost. See, they already had the Holy Ghost dwelling them, but now they're filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The Spirit's the one giving them the utterance. That the, you know, they're speaking with the other tongues. It's not just people hearing them, because we're going to see that later as well. They're speaking with other tongues. Now, what the Pentecostal movement will say and, and if, you, if you've ever seen this, it's, it's really bizarre. They'll have people, and, and you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> to try my best to, to replicate what they do, but when you go to the church and someone starts to, what they say, speaking in tongues, they'll just, someone will stand up or be sitting in a chair, and they'll start going, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and, it's, and it is, it's kind of funny, it's, but, it's, but it's, 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 it's scary too because... What happens is when it, you know, there's some people that I believe are just faking it because, you know, you're around a group of people and they believe in their doctrine that, hey, if, you if you're saved, you're going to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And if you have the Holy Ghost, you're going to speak in tongues. So they want everyone else around them to think, hey, I'm saved too. So I'm going to, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make it look like I'm doing this. So I'm sure there's a lot of frauds out there. But I, you know what? I also believe that there's a lot of people where... It's not them doing that, yeah. and that it's just what it is. It's a false spirit. There's a devil yeah. that comes and, and possesses them, and they just they lose control because every single one of these people, when you ask them, do you know what you said? Do you know what happened? They have no clue. No clue. They lose, they lose the time. The time from before, you know, that they remember what happened right up until that point, and afterwards, people have to tell them, oh, yeah, man, you were, you know, you were going for five minutes or whatever. No idea. And we're going to see a little bit later why that's just completely false. The Bible says that the, you know, um, the spirit of God, you know, the, the spirit is subject unto the prophets. You're in the driver's seat. You're not. You're, you know, just lose control. That's not of God. When you just completely lose control and you don't know what you're doing, um, that is that is not God's spirit that's indwelling you when that happens. That is that is a devil that is being possessed, and you know it's. It's bad enough, I mean, you can see easily that their doctrine, they have a false gospel, they're not saved. So you know right off the bat, it's not just going to be, they're not going to be receiving gifts from God when they're not even saved, when they're believing in a workspace salvation and they believe you have to, to live a, a, you know, a good life and they believe you have to have works of baptism or anything else to be saved. But the other reason why it's ridiculous is because nobody understands what that person's saying. When they just start doing that gibberish and they just start rambling and, and just speaking whatever, nobody understands what in the world that person is saying, which is completely, completely contrary to what's going on here in the book of Acts. We're going to keep reading. Look at verse number, uh, verse number five, and it says, And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. So it's saying, this time, there were Jews there at Jerusalem, at the city, that were from every nation under heaven. Every single nation that existed at that time, there were Jews there from those nations. Now, you say, well, how is it Jews? I thought Jews were just the children of Israel. First of all, you know, the, the, the Jews, the, the children of Israel were conquered and they were taken out of their land by the Babylonians. But not only that, um, I don't think I have a reference here, but people, it says in the Old Testament that people were made Jews. 
Like, if someone from another nation wanted to come and become a Jew, they can. Because that was the religion they practiced. They, if someone was in a foreign country, in a heathen land, and they recognized, because there were Jews spread out all over the place, they heard about the Lord, they believed on the Lord, they called upon the name of the Lord and got saved, because salvation's always been by grace through faith. They called upon God and got saved. Oftentimes, these people from heathen lands would come and become Jews. And that's why they had these rules, you know, like... Um, I think it was the children of Ammon and, you know, some other... When they had the genealogies and they practiced in the Old Testament, there were certain people that were not allowed to come into the temple because they were from such a wicked country. But it doesn't mean that they weren't saved. There was just certain offices, certain things that they couldn't do. God ever searched and said, like, unto the tenth generation, they're not allowed in here. But they were still saved and they could still become a Jew. Now, um... So there's Jews there, it says, out of every nation under heaven, there's people gathered from all over the place, from all over the known world. There were people gathered together here at Jerusalem. And it says in verse 6, Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded. So people were confused, because that every man heard them speak, get this, in his own language. So it says in verse number 4, And they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues, then it says in verse number 6 at the end, because every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we are born? So you notice, it will say tongue, language, tongue, language. It's going to go back and forth showing you that, look, there's no difference between tongue and language. They mean the exact same thing. When it says tongue, that's not some weird thing. It's not just some gibberish. Blah, blah, blah. It's a language. It's something people can understand. And why were they all confused? It says they were confounded in verse number 6 because every man heard them speak in his own language. So there's people there from all over the world, every known nation. And they were able to understand them. They say, wait, look, aren't you guys all Galileans? Aren't you all from this one area? How is it possible that I could hear you speak and you're speaking my language. They know they're not from on the other end of the world. They know they're not from these, these random countries way far off. Yet they can listen to them, they can hear them, and they're speaking their language. That was amazing. That was incredible. And I believe that God, you know, instituted this miracle to happen. I mean, I know he did. He had a plan. It was the day of Pentecost. It was a, it was a, you know, it was a, a high holy day. People came in. From all over the world, the Jews, the devout Jews came in because this was a big event. That's why they're all gathered together in one place. Very shortly, right after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, God keeps them there. He says, wait, don't go out yet. I want you to stay in Jerusalem. Stay there. I've got an important work for you to do. They didn't know what it was, but they said God told them to stay. They stuck around. They were baptized with the Holy Ghost, and this is what happened. They, they got this, this great miracle of these tongues where they were able to go out there and speak the word of God in, 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 in every language under the sun. And this proves as well that God is able to speak any language. Now, if they were speaking the word of God, right, God is not restricted to, oh, you can only, you can only get God's word in Hebrew, or you can only get God's word in the Greek. That's false. That's a lie. God can speak any language. God's the one that created language at the, the Tower of Babel. He created the languages. He's the one that confounded man and, and gave them all separate languages for their separate nations to divide them. God's word can be translated into any language. You don't need to go back to learn some special meaning. These people were all able to hear the, the word of God in their own language. And, and it says, and it starts to list them off in verse 9. It says, Parthians and Medes and Elamites. So it's saying specifically, look, the tongue wherein we were born, the language, our native language, and it lists off all of these places, Parthians, Medes, you know, Arabians, Jews, proselytes, all these people. We all hear them. It says in verse 11, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. They're preaching about God. They're, they're, they're teaching them about God. It says in verse 12, And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one another, What meaneth this? Others mocking said, These men are full of new, new wine. So people see this and they're like, You know, some people are just trying to make a joke. I'm saying they're mocking. Oh, yeah, they're drunk. You know, they're, 
Who knows what they're doing? Because they're hearing them speak in other languages. But the people from the other places, they understood exactly what they were saying. And they were teaching them. Go ahead and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 because this gives us a lot more insight on this doctrine of, of speaking with other tongues. But I think, I mean, in Acts chapter 2, it's clear enough what's going on here. They're not just in, they're not just having a church service with just them. And then they all just start standing up and, and, and gibberish and, and know what I'm saying. And they're just, you know, the spirit comes over them and they just start rattling off in another language. That's not what happens here. They're speaking to people, first of all, because these people are understanding them. It's not, and these people aren't just all gathered together with them in church. They went out to speak to these people and these devout Jews, and they all were able to hear them speak in their own language. And that's clear. I mean, there's, there's no, there, it's irrefutable from the Bible that, that anything else is going on besides them preaching and, and speaking in a known language of people that somebody knows. Now look at, are you in 1 Corinthians chapter 14? Look at uh, verse number 2, it says, well, I'll start reading in verse number 1. It says, follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. So they call it a spiritual gift, which it is. I mean, it, this was a spiritual gift, but they, they have grossly misinterpreted. He's going to explain it here. He says, first, you know, follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts. So it's, good to, it's good to want spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. So he's starting off the chapter saying, look, preaching, prophesying is more important. It says, For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mystery. So he's saying, look, if people don't know the language, if people don't know the tongue, if it's an unknown tongue to the people that are there, and now look, when it says an unknown tongue, I don't think that just means some unknown tongue that nobody in the world knows. I think he's referring to people that that nobody there, like if, if I were to start speaking in Chinese tonight, I know that nobody here speaks Chinese. That's an unknown tongue to everyone. It's an unknown tongue to myself included. Okay, no one's going to know. I won't even know. So if I were to do that, if, if, if I were to receive this, this power of the Holy Ghost, where I'm able to, 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 to speak in another language that I don't even know, if I were to do it in an unknown tongue to everyone here, so he speaketh not unto men, I'm just going to be speaking to God, because God's going to be the only one that understands me. For no man understandeth him, how be it in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. But he that prophesieth speaketh un, unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. So he's saying, look, but if you're preaching, if you're prophesying, you're speaking unto men, you're going to edify them, you're going to build them up, you're going to exhort them and comfort them. Verse 4, he that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. But he that prophesieth edifieth the church. So again, here we see, look, if someone's going to be speaking an unknown tongue, church is not the place to be doing that anyways if no one understands the language. What's the point of doing it? No one's going to understand you. It's not going to edify anyone. But if you get up and preach like in English, like we speak, and whatever, whatever the common tongue is for the people of the church, then it is going to do them good. They are going to get edified. They're going to hear the word of God. They're going to hear the prophesying. They're going to hear the preaching. And it's going to do some good for them. Verse 5, it says, I would that ye all spake with tongues, but rather that ye prophesied. Again, emphasis on preaching, on prophesying, not on speaking in tongues, which, you know, this, this Pentecostal movement has it backwards. They put all the emphasis on speaking. Oh, well, you got to speak in tongues. And I, I mean, I can't tell you how many people ask me, like, oh, so you're a Christian. Have you ever spoken tongues? Like, that's their question for me. Not, you know, have you ever preached the gospel? Not have you ever preached? Paul's saying here, I'd rather that you preach, not, not speaking in tongues. He's like, hey, yeah, it'd be great. And he doesn't say speaking in tongues, speaking with tongues or with other tongues. You know, I'd rather that, that you prophesy. It says, for greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. So look, and this would, it wouldn't really make much sense unless we had maybe someone who spoke Spanish here. But if I started preaching in Spanish, it's not going to do you any good if you don't understand Spanish unless I interpret it and say, okay, well, you know, what I just said was this, and then you can understand it. It's the only way it's going to do you any good. 
And that happens, and you see that a lot in churches today. There are people who have a guest preacher. Maybe we have a guest preacher that comes in and says, you know, I meet someone, and, and maybe I understand their language, and I can understand what they're saying, and, um, you know, they're a great man of God. Man, I want this guy to come in, but he doesn't speak English. Right? But I really want people to hear what he has to say. He's got a good message. He's going to edify the church. So oftentimes, a lot of churches know people like that, and they'll bring these people in, and what they do is they just have an interpreter. They have someone, that the, the man that speaks his native language, he, he, he starts preaching, and as he's preaching, someone else is standing next to him and talking and interpreting and saying exactly what he's saying in the language that everyone else speaks. People, they do that even with sign language. You see that in churches as well. People who are deaf, they can't hear the word that's preached. They have a language, they have a sign language. So someone else will be standing up there while the preaching is going on, and they'll be given the sign language so people who are deaf can understand what's being said and what's going on. They can then receive the word in their own language. Now, where was I here? In verse number 6, says, Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge, or by prophesying or by doctrine? It says in verse 7, And even things without life, giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? Again, he's, he's equating this to sounds of instruments or music. So there are certain sounds, especially in those days with, with getting men, you know, putting the battle in array, getting your army ready. You know, you have troops lined up over, over a large distance. So they're not necessarily going to be able to hear the voice of a man. But they are going to be able to hear a trumpet or a group of trumpets. They're going to be able to hear that all the way down the lines. So they've established certain sounds. When you hear this sound, you know what that means. That's going to mean charge, or it's going to mean retreat. You know, it's going to give them orders based on the sound of what's being trumpeted by these instruments. And he's saying, look, if you just start giving some uncertain sound, if you just, just, just blow whatever, you just kind of blow into it, and you're not making any distinct sound, no one's going to know what that means. There's going to be confusion. It's going to do no good whatsoever. In fact, it's probably going to do worse because then people aren't going to know anything that's going on. They're going, what was that? Should we go? Do we stay? What do, you know, what do we do? And that's what he's saying here. Look, if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. And it's worthless. You're speaking into the air. And that's what these Pentecostals do when they, when they speak in their tongues. It's worthless. They're speaking into the air. It's not doing anyone any good. No one understands what they're saying. And, and it's funny, too, because a lot of people claim, oh, yeah, I know what they're saying. And, you know, because they say, like, they're saying whatever. And, they, and then they just make up whatever they want. Because the person that's doing doesn't know what they're saying. No one else knows what they're saying. So if someone stands up and says, oh, yeah, they're saying this. Yeah, right. You have no idea what that person said. You don't know that language. They wouldn't be able to repeat anything in, in whatever that made-up language is anyways. And it says, you just, you know, you're just going to be speaking in the air. It's not good for anyone. It's not going to edify anyone. It says in verse 10, it says, There are, maybe, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. They all have a meaning. They all have significance. All these different voices have significance. It says, therefore... If I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. Look, you're, you're just going to be like a barbarian. You say, you can't just sit out and have a conversation with someone when neither one of you speak a common language. It's going to be meaningless. You're not going to understand anything that's going on. It says, even, even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. Don't seek after these gifts of speaking with other tongues. It's not gonna. It's not gonna benefit anyone. He says, you know, you're zealous of these spiritual gifts. You want to get them. Seek that he makes of the edifying of the church. So, what the, the goal of these gifts is to edify the church. So, the goal of, of of speaking with another tongue is to preach the gospel to someone who speaks that language. It's to preach God's word unto someone who speaks that language. It's not for your own glory to say, oh, look at me, I'm speaking with other tongues. 
Just, to, just because you're doing it, you know, just to bring the, the focus on yourself. It says, for if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is it then? I will pray with the spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. Again, there's people who get, there's, there's all different spectrums of this bizarre speaking in tongues movement. And some people, you know, they, they can see, they, they, they kind of been just pinned down on some of these points. And, and see, well, okay, well, yeah, that's, you're right. People that do that, they shouldn't be doing that. But I still believe, you know, in, in prayer. And I, I, I knew one person was just like, well, when I pray, sometimes I, I pray in, in, in other tongues. And again, Paul's saying, look, I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. He says, look, I'm not going to pray in, in an unknown tongue that I don't know. I'm going to pray because I'm not, that's not going to do any good. I'm not going to understand it, right? So he's saying, I'm going to pray with the Spirit and the understanding. I'm going to understand what it is that I'm praying. I'm not just going to go and, and try to, to, to speak with another tongue in my prayer to God. I'm not going to do it. I mean, and these people that think that you should do it ought to read 1 Corinthians chapter 14 real closely because he's saying here exactly that you shouldn't be doing that, that you should be praying like he did. Pray with the understanding also. It says, else, when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say amen at thy giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest? How can anyone even say amen to that? We had a preacher come up today that just, just spoke Chinese. You're not going to be able to say, oh yeah, that's good, amen. You have no idea because you don't know what he's saying. For thou verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. I thank my God I speak with tongues more than ye all. Yet in the church I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Again, what is the emphasis on? The emphasis on, especially in the church, is preaching and teaching the church edifying other members of the church. He's saying, look, it doesn't matter if, you, if, I, if I came up and spoke 10,000 words in some other language. It's nothing. It's vanity. It's useless. And I don't understand why it's so hard for, them, for people to understand this, or for, especially for the Pentecostal movement, to look at this. I mean, this is an entire chapter devoted to this. And we saw in Acts chapter 2, 1 Corinthians 14, I mean, Paul just lays it out here. And it's extremely clear but it's because they don't understand. They have the veil over their face. They're darkened. They don't understand. They're not saved. And they think that they're going to, you know, when they speak in tongues in the church, that they're really, they're really filled with the Spirit. That's a lie. That's not true. It says in... Uh, let's jump down to... Verse number 22, because I want to get off of this point. I'm spending a little bit more time here than I want to. Verse 22 says, Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. This is a very profound statement, because there's a lot, there's, a such, there's so many things we can learn from this one verse. It says the tongues, speaking of tongues, it's not a sign for those that believe. This is not something they do. And again, where do they do the speaking tongues? It's in their church. Now, church is supposed to be a place for believers. The believers come into the church. That's what a church is. A church is a congregation of believers. By definition, that's what a church is. Coming to church is just for the believers. So why in the world would people just be speaking, standing up and speaking in unknown tongues in the middle of church? It says it's a sign for those that are not saved, those that don't believe. These people in Jerusalem that saw this, they were able to see the power of God because these men that obviously didn't know these languages were able to speak in another language. They had the power of God on them, and they could witness this and see, oh, wow. And it might even be themselves, someone who doesn't believe. Wow, I'm here. This, this person's coming to me and speaking my language. And honestly, people will give you a lot more respect and they'll listen to you more when you try to speak their language. I've noticed I'm not very, I'm not fluent in Spanish. I know enough to give the gospel, but that's about it. I know very little Spanish. I know enough to, to, to show people, especially if they know a little bit of English, it makes it a lot easier. 
they can understand me a little bit better, especially when my grammar is not, not, a pro, not correct, is not exactly right. But um, I've noticed a lot of people that speak Spanish will give me probably way more time than they would have if um, maybe, maybe if I was a native speaking Spanish person, or um, obviously if I didn't know how to speak their language at all, then I'm not even going to be able to reach them. But a lot of people, when they see that I'm trying to speak their language, even though I'm not very good at it, they'll, they'll listen, they'll stop. Man, a lot of people do. When, when um, you know, I try speaking to them in English, if I notice they're having a hard time, I'll say, oh, you know, habla español, you know, and, and just, just start talking to them that way. And they respect that, and they appreciate that, too, that you're coming to them with their language. And I think that's just kind of inherent to us as people when someone comes to you. Like if someone were to come to you that didn't know English very well, but they really wanted, they really had something they wanted to tell you, they really had something important, they had a Bible, they want to talk to you, you'll probably, you know, give them a little bit of respect and just say, okay, well, yeah, I'll listen to what you have to say. You're trying really hard, you're struggling, you want to do this. You know, and um, when God gave them this, this miracle, I think it, it, it had an impact on people who didn't believe because they could see this, wow, they're speaking in my language, now I'll listen to what they have to say. And um, it's obviously not a place for the church to be doing that. It says, uh, but the preaching is for the church, the prophesying is for the church. It's not for the unbeliever. So all the stuff I'm preaching about tonight or what I, and, and my sermons, mostly, they're not, they're not for the unbeliever. It's not going to do them any good. What they need to do is get saved. They need to hear the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because I'll tell you what, my sermons are not all the gospel every single time I get up and preach. It's lots of learning and doctrine and, and other teaching that's important for the edification of us as believers. We need to go out to them and get them saved and bring them in to learn from the preaching. In verse uh, 23, it says, And therefore the whole church be come together into one place, and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers. Will they not say that ye are mad? And that's exactly what I would say if I walked into a church and people were all rolling around. Ah, ah, ah. I'd say, they're mad. They're, they, they have a devil. There's something wrong with them. I'm out of here. That's just scary. It says, but if, you, if all prophesy and there come in one that believeth not or one unlearned, he is convinced of all. He is judged of all. So the preaching can do some good. If someone were to come in tonight and were to hear some of this preaching, they could, if they could understand it because they speak English, then that might actually do them some good. They could be convinced of all that spoken. They could be judged of all from God's word. And that could sing in their heart and do some good. And then it says, jump down to verse number 32 in Acts 14. It says, and this is what I was talking about earlier. It says, and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. That means, subject means that the prophets have control over those spirits. They're subject, they're under them. So the, the spirit of God, and, and when you're moved by the spirit of God, you still are in control and you're not just completely out of the driver's seat, you know, God's not going to make my hands move up and down and do all this stuff where, like, I have no control over that. And he's not just going to take over my vocal cords and just, and just say whatever it is that he wants me to say without any of my control. It's still, it's still coming through me where, where I can quench the spirit, I can silence it and not speak it, or I could, I could preach it. Either way... Um, you know, the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Verse 33 says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Let's turn back to, to the book of Acts, chapter 2. I'm going to get off of that. I think it's extremely clear. And don't be deceived by this, this tongue-speaking movement, because a lot of people look at it and they'll say, Wow! Because they'll see it. And the people who are, who are really like involved in this, and they really get into it, I mean, it, it's a sight to behold. It's something that, like, you know, when, when someone's not faking it and it seems pretty real, people will look at that and go, wow, that's, that, that's real. This must be from God. And it's kind of easy to get deceived because they'll see that and, like, well, yeah, I mean, it, you know, I want to feel that, too. So many people are longing for an experience and for a feeling. And, and for some proof and some signs that God is real, and they see this and they buy into it, and that's where they see like these, these phony faith healers that go out and they slap people on the forehead, and they're falling down left and right. People get sucked right into that. I mean, it's just as much as people get sucked into the, to the nonsensical psychics out there that, that will try to predict your future and tell you all these things, because people have this, this desire sometimes to just 
want to believe in something, and they want to believe in whatever, and then just that they want proof and evidence of this of, of, of this existence of God around them. So they see these things and say, oh, well, this, this must be God. And it's not. They're just being deceived. It's the devil deceiving them. But we're going to get off the, 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 the tongue-speaking movement. We're going to continue on here in Acts chapter 2. It says, but Peter, verse 14, but Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing as but the third hour of the day. He's saying, look, you know, third hour of the day is like nine in the morning. He's saying, look, it's nine, nine o'clock in the morning. These men aren't drunk. Okay? He said, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Prophesy is preaching, of course, and it says, I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before that great and notable, notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, wouldn't you wish that they just got their doctrine from Acts 2.21 instead of Acts 2.37 and 2.38? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I mean, it's right there in the same chapter, and yet they kind of skip over that. And again, I'm not going to get into this because I'm, I'm really running out of time. But um, there's, a, there's a lot of good references here to the end times events, the day of the Lord. You know, the, the sun and moon being dark, darkened, the moon turn being turned into blood. Lots of good stuff there. Turn back to Joel, and not right now, but, but later on. Go check out that quote from Joel chapter number 2, where this is taken from, because Joel 2 is packed with, with all kinds of end times prophecy doctrine in there. And um, it's a really interesting read. We're going to skip over that tonight, though, because there's another important subject I want to hit on. It says, Ye men of Israel, verse 22, Hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, the man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. They, look, you know, you saw these miracles, you know it was of God. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holding others. So he's saying, look, you, your wicked hands are the ones that crucified Jesus Christ. You're the ones that killed him. God raised him up from the dead. It wasn't possible they should be holding of it. It says in verse 25, For David speak in concern, speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. For he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with, with thy countenance. And then he explains it. So he's quoting Psalms. He's quoting what David said in Psalms. Right? And then now he's going to expound it unto me. He's going to explain it. He's preaching. He says... Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. He's saying, look, David's dead, he's buried, he's gone, his sepulcher is here. He says, therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ. So that's what he said, look, David knew this. He knew, God had already promised him that that basically Christ was going to be born of his descendants. That, that the line of David, you know, David had a kingly line that had secession where, where, you know, kings would rule and reign because David was a righteous man of God. David was a man after God's own heart, and God blessed him, and he made him a promise that, that the Christ, that the true king, the king of kings, was going to come and be born, you know, physically into this world, of that, of that lineage from David. So that through, you know, of the flesh he was going to be David's seed. And it says to sit on the throne. And that says in verse 31, He seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. You see, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, 
When Jesus Christ bare the sins of the whole world in his own body, when he died on that cross, you know what they did? They took his body and they buried it in a tomb. But the Bible says his soul descended into hell. The soul of Jesus Christ went to hell. And I'm sorry, there is no other definition of the word hell. There is no pleasant, nice place of hell. Hell is a place of eternal burning and torture and torment. And Jesus Christ was in that place because he died to pay the punishment for our sins. Now, the punishment for our sins when we die is hell. The judgment, the, the, the debt that we owe is hell. If we got what we deserve, and if that's all we got, because we don't deserve heaven, if we got the punishment that we deserve to pay for our sins, it would be an eternity of hell. Jesus Christ came and took our sins on himself. He embodied sin for us. So that when he died on that, on that cross, he didn't just go to heaven. He didn't go to some, to some nice place, you know, under the earth, wherever that exists, with, in Abraham's bosom that, that people will try to teach. No, the Bible says he went to hell. Okay, and all throughout the Bible, you would never find a positive mention of the word hell. Hell is always a bad place. It's always a place of torture, torment, and it makes sense. It makes sense that Jesus Christ's soul went to hell. He had our sins. He went to pay the punishment. He was the atonement for our sins. He paid for them in full. And it's very clear here that he, Peter is expounding, saying, look, he spake of the resurrection of Christ, the fact that Jesus Christ came back from the dead, that his soul was not left in hell. Neither his flesh should see corruption. He spells it out for us that Jesus Christ went to hell, but it, his soul was not left there because he rose from the dead. That's what this, this scripture in Psalm is explaining. And, and uh, Peter explains that here. And there's a few other places to back that up. It's, this is not just the only proof text for that. It says in Matthew, you don't have to turn there for a second time, Matthew 12, verse 39. Go ahead and turn to the book of Jonah. Matthew 12, 39 says, But he answered and said, This is Jesus Christ speaking, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. You know what? Actually, turn to Exodus chapter 12. We're going to spend a little bit more time in there. Exodus 12. I changed my mind. I'm going to read uh, Matthew and Jonah for you. Turn to Exodus 12. An evil, adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas, which is Jonah. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The heart of the earth is the center, my friends. My heart is in the center of the cavity of my body here, in my, in my torso. It's in the middle. It's in the center. It's a little bit to the left, but it's in the center. Okay? Hell is in the heart of the earth would be the core, the center of the earth, my friends. Even science will tell you the, the heat, I mean, it's, just, it's off the charts. It's a hot place, okay? There's, that's where the lava comes from, from out of these volcanoes. It comes from, from inside the earth. The earth is heated. It's a hot core. That is where hell exists. That is where hell is today. That's where the Bible says that hell is. And Jesus Christ said that just as Jonas was for three days and three nights, Jonah was in that whale's belly. He was in the middle of the whale's belly. Well, the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, was going to be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And in Jonah 2, you have to turn there. Jonah 2, 2 says, and, you know, because Jonah was kind of going back and forth. He's given his prophecy. He was, he was in the whale's belly. He says, you know, he had seaweed around his head. But then he says, in, in verse 2, he says, and, and said, I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. And in verse 6, he says, I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. Jonah even prophesied this, and I think that's why Jesus Christ made mention of it. He refers back to Jonah. He refers back to this story. He refers back to when Jonah was three days and three nights in the, in the whale's belly. Jonah in chapter 2, he, he, you know, he mixes in his kind of what he's going through in the whale's belly, and then he kind of goes back and forth a little bit between these prophecies of Jesus Christ. Jonah didn't go to hell. Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly. Jonah's not the one that went to hell. That's why being a prophet, as David was a prophet, he spake concerning Christ and concerning, you know, prophesied about Jesus Christ. He says in verse 2, And I cried by reason of my affliction on the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell, cried I. Jesus Christ is in the belly of hell. Jonah was in the belly of the whale. Now look at Exodus chapter 12, because this is another place. 
another reference. And, and Exodus 12 is not the, the, you know, the, 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 the concrete evidence. We've already seen that. Peter spells it out pretty clear in Acts chapter 2. Jesus Christ spells it out pretty clear in Matthew chapter 12. Jonah, we just go back to the reference. In Exodus chapter 12, it's just talking about the Passover. And it talks about the Lamb. Now, who is the Lamb? Who's always referred to as the Lamb in the New Testament? It's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. Jesus Christ is the Lamb. The Old Testament gave us a picture of the things to come. Well, we're going to look at what they did with the Lamb in Exodus chapter number 12. In verse number 3, I'm going to go through this real quick. I'm totally running out of time here. Verse number 3 says, Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And that was verse number 3. Look at verse number 4 of Exodus 12. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it, according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish. The male the first year, you shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. Now we're going to start seeing here attributes of Jesus Christ that are tied up in this picture of his, of his death for, the, for everybody, for mankind, for their sins. Verse 5 says, the lamb shall be without blemish. That means there's no fault in him. There's no spot. There's, no, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. Jesus Christ was perfect. Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. He had no sin. He was without blemish. Look at verse number 6. It says, And ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Again, this is referring to when the Jews brought forth Jesus Christ, and they all said, Crucify him! Crucify him! His blood be on our heads and our children's. The whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is going to kill it. Jesus Christ was killed essentially by the Jews, the multitude of Jews saying, crucify him, crucify him. Because Pilate did not want to crucify him, but the mob that was out there was calling for it, and they were the ones who, you know, who had the greater sin. Verse number 7, And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts. And I heard this spoken before, I think it's pretty neat. They had to take the blood, and they had to put the blood on the two door posts, or it said on the two side door posts and on the upper door post. And when you do that, you know, that action makes a cross. And I think that's kind of, kind of cool. I don't know, I mean, I'm sure it's not in there by accident, but um, again, another just, just illustration, example of what's going to happen to Christ. Christ was crucified on the cross. You know, the action of, of putting the blood on the door posts would make a cross. Verse 8 says, And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Now the unleavened bread, you know, leaven is, is throughout the Bible, again, is, is um, a symbol for sin. Jesus Christ was sinless, that's why it's unleavened bread, he's without sin. But it says, but even before that, roast with fire. So it says that flesh that you're going to eat of that lamb, that lamb sacrifice, it's going to be roast with fire. Look at verse number 9. He goes on to explain it very clearly, very explicitly. In case you didn't understand what roast with fire means, he says, Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire his head, with his legs, and with the pertinence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. He said, look, don't boil it, don't put it in water, don't eat it raw, fire Cook it, burn it with fire, and anything that's left over, burn all of it with fire. Well, you know, he says, don't let any of it remain till the morning. Make sure it is all burned with fire. He makes a very specific point to say, look, this is burnt with fire. Because I'll tell you what, Jesus Christ paid for our sins when he went to hell, and he was in hell for three days and three nights, and he was burnt with fire in hell. Verse 11, it says, and thus shall he eat it. With your loins girded, with your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Jesus Christ is our Passover lamb. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you, destroy you when I, come, when I smite the land of Egypt. You know, 
Go back to Acts chapter 2. We're going to finish up real quick. Two key doctrines in this chapter. One is on that the, the speaking with other tongues. I just want to make sure we all understand that, that those are real legitimate tongues. Those are re real legitimate languages that were spoken. And this doctrine, and this doctrine's not taught very much today, I don't think, about, about Jesus Christ actually going to hell. A lot of people don't realize that. Sometimes I bring it up about soul winning, and people are just like, what? Like, Jesus went to hell? Like, well, yeah, you, I mean, he had the sins of the whole world. The whole world. I mean, think about your own sins. It's sins enough. That's sinful enough. He had to send to the whole world for all generations. I mean, billions, trillions, I mean, who knows how many people have existed on this earth. All of that sin Jesus Christ had on himself. Jesus Christ paid a tremendous price for our sins. Jesus Christ, the Bible says, Jesus Christ himself said that he went to hell. But thanks be to God, his soul was not left in hell. Neither did his flesh see corruption. The flesh that was in the tomb, that didn't see corruption. It didn't you know, rot. He, um, he was raised up from the dead. He conquered death and hell. He has the keys to death and hell. And um, he paid for our sins. Now, um, we're going to finish up the chapter here. And it says, This Jesus that God raised up, where we all are witnesses, to Acts 2, verse 33, Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the, Holy, of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. So he explains all of this stuff before then we get into this point where we say, Look, what shall we do? And we already went over that. You know, they were pricked in their hearts because they, they understand, or at least some of these people I think understood what happened. And then in verse 39, it says, For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day were, there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So this is a great event. This is a huge event that happens here. When they go out and they're able to, to, to speak with these other tongues, because a lot of these people, I mean, they were devout people. They were interested in the things of God. But not even just them. I mean, all these people see what's been happening. All the groundwork of Jesus Christ has already been laid. The life that he lived, you know, John, John the Baptist going out preaching. This is just ripe. It's, the field is ripe for the harvest. And 3,000 people get saved. And that's, that's incredible. It says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them all men, and every man as every man had need. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. And you know what? That's the type of, of spirit that I'd like to have here, to have everyone in one accord, in one place. We're all, you know, we've all believed the same fundamental doctrines. We all have the same spirit. We all love people. We all love God. We want to serve Him. We're going we're gonna to join together to do something great. We're going to be a local church. We're going to be a local congregation and go out and do some great things for God with gladness, we should be happy. I mean, there's joy. There's great joy in serving God. And with singleness of heart. We're not going to be worried about the cares of this world. We're going to have our heart single on serving God. And then look at the last verse. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. That's what I was talking about earlier. God is going to add to the church. We don't need to worry about doing it in our own power, our own might. Now, we need to do what God told us to do which is preaching the gospel to every creature, which is going out and compelling them to come in. We need, we need to go out and do these things. But God's the one that's going to build the church. So don't get discouraged by a slow church growth. It doesn't matter. I'll tell you what, I am not going to get discouraged by that because I have already had some experience with the best church that I've ever known in this entire world with Faithful Word Baptist Church. I was in a part of that church when it was very small, meeting in the house. And I'll tell you what, the growth was slow, 
And sometimes it was very slow, but it was steady. And you know, it didn't matter. It didn't matter. Because we were doing what was right. We were doing to the best of our abilities, trying to follow the Bible, trying to follow, you know, what, what God has for us to do. And you know what? God has built that church. Now the church is great. I mean, the church is, is, is way bigger than it was. It's running 100 people easily. And why? And if, you know what? It's not just filled with 100 people, just random people. It's filled with 100 people that love God. It's a church of people that, that have a strong desire where the vast majority of the people go out. So, I mean, a vast majority of the congregation goes out soul winning, preaches the gospel, and does a lot of work. And they love their neighbors, and they love the people of the church, and they help people out. We've, I've never received so much help from anyone as much as we've received from our church. And um, it's a great group of people. And you know what? I want this church to be the same way, but it's not going to happen overnight. In order to get people that love God, we need to put in the work. We need, to, we need to get our hands dirty and let God build the church. And we just need to follow his commandments and have patience. Just as a seed you plant in the ground, it's going to take some time. It's going to grow. It's going to grow slowly, but we're going to grow. And if we're doing what's right, God's going to bring people. God's going to want people to come here. I guarantee you that if, you know, as long as we stick true and faithful to God's word, God's going to bring people in. Why wouldn't he? There's a lot. I know there's a lot of saved people in this community. I've talked to a bunch of them. You think God wants them going to, to either no church or a church where they're not being fed, they're not growing, they're not doing what's right? I mean, I don't know how many good churches there are out here. I don't think there's very many. That's why we started the church. And um, I guarantee you God's going to want them coming here. I got, we'll let God build the church. And we're going to reach the lost. We're going to get people saved and bring them in too. But um, let's let it be in God's time. Let him build the church, as he said at the end of Acts chapter 2. And let's bow right over heads in that word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for the Bible. I thank you for Acts, for the book of Acts. Dear God, I love it. I love all the action. Dear God, help us to be stirred up. Help our hearts to be stirred up and, and to, to just be motivated to, to do things for you, dear God, and to serve you and, and have that gladness and the joy of being in one accord or one place, dear God. And um, Lord, I pray that you would please just help us. Um, Help those that are deceived by, by some of these, these false doctrines of the, the tongues movement or, um, you know, not understanding the fact that Jesus Christ went to hell, dear Lord. There are two, there are two major doctrines of the Bible, and you spent a lot of time um, in many chapters talking about them and devoted a lot of your word to dealing with these issues, dear God. And, uh, and that's why I spent a lot of time on them tonight, because they're important. And Lord, I pray that you would please just, just help us all to remember these things and to, to know the scriptures and to be able to, to show anyone that, you know, that has a question of our faith. Dear Lord, help, help us to show them from the scripture why we believe what we believe. It's, it's really important that we're founded on your word. And not just, oh, because Pastor Burson said this, or, or someone else said this, you know, and that's why I don't believe it. It's because of what, your Bible, what the Bible says, what your word says, dear God. And uh, we love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.